Hello, and welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. Thanks so much for tuning in. Tonight, we'll begin a dreamy retelling of the classic tale, Beauty and the Beast. It's a perfectly autumnal story to lead you into a good night's sleep. Now then, let's just take a moment to settle in and let go of any unease lingering in the body or mind. Make sure you're comfortable and as you ease into stillness, Just allow your breathing to draw out a little longer, particularly on the exhale. Focus your attention as much as you can on your breathing. Let the slow, steady rhythm of the airflow become a mindful, and soothing experience. When I speak to you here, prior to each story, I try to say the things that I know I would want to hear if I were falling asleep to this show. I've found the process of getting to sleep in particular rather difficult throughout much of my life. I still have bad patches nowadays, but I've gradually learned to remain calm and not let it stress me out on those difficult nights. Yes, it can make the next day a fair bit more challenging, but getting worked up about it only brings more wakefulness. So remember, While you listen along tonight, you can use your breath to help pacify any stress, tension, or worry. It's a simple yet effective way to calm the nervous system and guide you into a beautiful night's sleep. And that's especially true when you combine those deep breaths with a dreamy bedtime story like this one. It's a tale as old as time. So, without further ado, let's drift into the fairy tale world of beauty and the beast. There was once a merchant named Laurent who staked his entire fortune on a fleet of ships but lost them all at sea. Being a widower, he didn't have to take this news home to a wife. However, he had six children who had grown used to a life of relative privilege. When the debts were called in and rumour spread that the family was penniless, most of them took the news hard. As days turned into weeks and the ships didn't appear in the port, the merchant had to begin selling their fine furniture, their carriage, and even his daughter's jewellery and expensive dresses. They had to give up their richly appointed house and move to a cottage on the outskirts of town. Laurent was frequently away, visiting business acquaintances and trying to find partners who might invest and help him rebuild his business. While he travelled, his children, who were three boys and three girls, were left 
to keep the house on their own. Although they were practically adults, the three boys and the two oldest girls were largely useless when it came to practical skills. They had become quite accustomed to a life of study and idle luxury. The youngest daughter, whose name was Camille, was the most willing to take on the necessary household chores now that they were without servants. Perhaps it was her more impressionable age, or perhaps it was that she had a sweeter, more steadfast temperament. Whatever the combination of factors, Camille did the best she could to learn the basics of running a household. Indeed, she was the only member of the family who was truly liked by the people in the village. Laurence Brood did not have many friends. To make their situation worse, the five oldest children also made no effort to adjust to their new lives. They did nothing to prove themselves capable or to endear themselves to the neighbours who might have helped them. Camille, however, sought advice from the villagers about unfamiliar skills such as baking, sewing, gardening, and keeping chickens. Their wariness turned to a genuine affection when they grew to appreciate her willingness to learn and to work hard. In this way, over time, she became the glue that held Laurent's household together. While the five older siblings struggled to accept their fate, unable to change, Camille ensured that they had a tidy home and that there was food on the table. One day, when the family had been living this way for nearly two years, Laurent received word that one of his lost ships had appeared in the port, its cargo largely intact. The family rejoiced at this miraculous news, the older five siblings declaring that their lives among the villagers were finally at an end. Camille took pleasure in their happiness, but the news did not seem as important to her as it did to the others. She had come to love their small cottage with its tidy garden and comforting aroma of baking bread. Although it would be a relief to see the rest of her family content, she was unsure as to whether she wanted to return to their former lives of idleness. She had become a person who liked being useful. In order to reclaim his property, Laurent had to travel to the port by horseback, and it would be a journey of a couple of days. Once there, he could arrange for the proper dispersal of his reclaimed wealth and hire a comfortable coach to bring him home. In anticipation of their improved fortunes, he asked each of his children what gift they would like to have from the city. The older siblings demanded finery. They asked for silk shoes with sparkling buckles, hats with elaborate trimmings, velvet capes, furs and jewels. 
Only Camel was silent, seeming to think very hard about what her request would be. When her father turned to her and told her to speak up, she hesitated briefly. In truth, father, I have always dreamed of seeing a rose, she said. They do not grow in this part of the country, and they are so exotic and expensive. If you could bring me a single rose in any colour, that would be lovely. He chuckled at the strange whims of his youngest, but he readily agreed. Privately, he thought he would also bring her a necklace or some sort of bauble to go with the flower. The weather was fine on the morning of his departure. Camille took care to pack his saddlebag with provisions for his journey, and she wished him farewell with a somewhat tearful smile. The others were more cavalier. They were used to their father's travels. They cared only for the gift they could now expect upon his return. As he rode away down the sun-dappled forest path, Camille alone waited in front of the cottage until he disappeared. She had a strange feeling of misgiving, but she didn't want to speak up. After all, their fortunes had obviously taken a turn for the better. While Laurent's children waited at the cottage, he steadily made his way to the port city, filled with anticipation of reclaiming his wealth and status. It was true, of course, that he had still suffered heavy losses. However, with the cargo in this ship, he could seed a new business, perhaps building up to a new fleet of ships. His head was filled with dreams of the spices, silks, and other goods he might import in the future. It was devastating to him, therefore, to arrive and find his dreams dashed. It was true, his ship had reappeared with most of its cargo unharmed. However, word had spread quickly of his good fortune, and his many creditors had taken swift action. By the time Laurent had come to claim his property, it had already been distributed to pay his many debts. In vain, he contacted one merchant after another, asking for an extension on his considerable bills. But it was no use. At the end of the day, he was a man without debts, but he was empty-handed. There was no money left for him to invest, and there was certainly no money to spend on the gifts he had promised to his family. He was so disheartened, he didn't even want to stay in the city overnight. Without properly provisioning himself, considering the weather, or sending any correspondence ahead of him, Laurent mounted his tired horse again and rode out of town, heading back down the provincial road that had brought him to the port 
that morning. Laurent was a few hours outside of the city when darkness fell and a storm descended. Lightning and thunder crashed all around him and the wind gusted mercilessly, blowing limbs off the trees. Laurent's horse became frightened and bolted away from the main road, taking him into an unfamiliar forest. Realizing too late that he had been foolish to undertake this nighttime journey, Laurent began searching in the gusting wind for any sort of shelter, such as a cave. How long his horse wandered through the howling gale, he did not know. Finally, he saw a tall stone wall arise before him. He urged the horse onward, hoping he had reached a house where he might shelter. Arriving at the forbidding wall of rock, he saw that it was not a house. It was the wall around an estate a tall and imposing iron gate stood ever so slightly open. Having no time for good manners, Laurent dismounted and pushed the heavy swinging gate wide enough to pull his horse through. Together they slowly headed up a paved walkway that receded ahead of them into the swirling darkness. With leaves flying all around and rain pelting him from all sides, Laurent could barely see the massive structure that emerged ahead of him in the wicked gloom. It was a mansion to be sure. Although his visibility was limited, he could see it had a grand approach and many large rooms with tall windows. It was a very intimidating place for a person to arrive uninvited, but he had no choice. He feared he could not survive the night without a roof over his head. Tying his horse up safely in a sheltered alcove, he walked to the massive front door and lifted the iron door knocker. He let it fall, hearing the sound echo through the gloom, as if in response to the thunder. When there was no answer, he took a deep breath and pushed the door inward with all his weight. It gave, and he found himself almost falling onto the floor of a grand entryway. Laurent lay on the cold flagstones for a moment, regaining his breath in the eerie stillness. He could still hear the rain lashing the front steps through the crack in the tall door, and thought to himself how glad he was that he'd found shelter for his horse. Rising in the semi-darkness, he peered about him. He was in a grand reception area with a curved staircase ascending on either side. Suits of armor stood sentinel here and there. Ahead of him there was a set of richly carved double doors. 
the silence inside the house was profound. He could have heard a pin drop, but there was a light glowing around the cracks of the doors in front of him. After a few half-hearted efforts to call out to the occupants, he took another deep breath and walked toward the lighted room. Pushing the doors slowly open, he leaned inside and scanned the room. A fire was roaring in the cavernous hearth. In front of it, a table was set for one, with a few simple dishes, a carafe, and a large drinking glass spread across it. His gaze took in the other aspects of the comfortable room. He saw upholstered chairs and tables carelessly stacked with books. Still, there was no sign of the owner. Laurent awkwardly sat down on one of the armchairs and waited for a few moments. Soon, he could not take his eyes from the simple dinner laid upon the table. The loaf of bread and the aroma of the roasted meat tormented him, and his stomach growled loudly. As minutes passed and nobody appeared, he soon gave in to his hunger and seated himself at the table, first taking just a slice of bread, and then slowly eating the entire meal. He passed an hour in contented silence. Perhaps, he thought, the owner was away from home and sheltering from the storm elsewhere. Taking a deep drink of the delicious liquid in the glass, he hungrily polished off the rest of the dinner. Yes, he told himself, the owner was away, and he would be able to explain himself in the morning. Upon finishing all the food, Laurent leaned happily back in his chair and drank the rest of the contents of the carafe. The fire danced before his eyes, crackling and popping with a comforting warmth. Draining the last drop from his large cup, he pulled the letter about his recovered cargo ship from his pocket. Just a short time ago, he had been so full of hope. Now, those dreams were gone again. He dropped the letter on the table and pushed it away. Without even realizing it, Laurent fell into a deep sleep. He slumbered through the night without dreaming. When he awoke in the morning, it took him a moment to remember where he was. The fire had long ago burned down, and the plates and glasses he'd used the night before were still on the table. It appeared that his host had not yet returned home. Feeling sheepish that he'd entered a stranger's home without invitation, his embarrassment got the better of him. Rather than wait for the return of the owner, Laurent resolved to slip out of the house as quietly as possible, 
and be quickly on his way. After all, he told himself, the dinner would obviously have gone to waste anyhow. Raising himself from the upholstered chair, Laurent moved across the chamber and pulled the double doors open. The morning light filtered weakly into the entryway, illuminating the austere hallway so that he could see it much better than the night before. Stepping self-consciously into the foyer, he found himself tiptoeing between the vigilant suits of armor, as if they might come to life any moment and bar his path. Peering around him at the twin curving staircases, he noted that their carpet runners appeared neglected and fusty. It was as if nobody had been living here for some time. He walked lightly across the flagstones to the enormous front door. He reached for the handles and pulled with all his might. It slowly slid open again, revealing a misty courtyard outside. Squeezing himself through the crack and then pushing it shut behind him, he straightened his waistcoat and attempted to muster some dignity. Escaping his forbidding refuge like a thief in the night felt wrong, but he would try to put this entire humiliating journey behind him. Making haste, he returned to the alcove where he'd left his horse tethered the night before. He was glad to find her well. He reached into his saddlebag to feed her an apple he had left over from the supplies Camille had packed for him. Then, untying the horse, he quietly led her down the stone path he had traveled in the whipping wind the night before. Looking behind him, he saw the mansion rising darkly into the growing daylight. It was an enormous chateau, long, beige and rectangular. The building had a main center section and was flanked by identical wings on either side. The windows were tall and narrow, lining all the two large floors with a regimented appearance. They seemed to be staring down at him. The sloping, tiled roof was thickly populated with chimneys. Turning away from the sight of the imposing chateau, he led the horse toward the front gate, taking in the overgrown gardens on either side of him. As he was nearing the end of the walkway, he spotted a particularly charming pergola that was overrun with rose bushes. Standing in the center of a round seating area was a rose bush blooming with the most stunning pink roses he'd ever seen. All at once he remembered his promise to Camille. Resolving to keep his word to his youngest daughter, he eagerly set to cutting blushing roses from the bush with a knife he kept in his bag. One rose would not be enough to make up for the circumstances of his reappearance. 
he would take them all. Laurent was so absorbed by his task that he didn't hear footsteps approaching. However, as he backed away from the rosebush, now devoid of all its blossoms, he sensed he was being watched. Turning, he saw a tall, fierce-looking man glowering down at him. Or, at least, he thought it was a man. The being who stood before him resembled a human, but he was bristling from beneath a wilderness of facial hair, and he had an abnormally tall and muscular build. Obviously not prepared for company, he was wearing a wrinkled linen shirt and breeches, as if he had stormed over in a hurry. He appeared to be furious. What do you think you are doing? He said in a loud growl, like that of a wolf. Laurent froze, painfully aware of the bouquet hanging from his left hand. He stuttered out an explanation, saying that he thought nobody lived here. He said he assumed the roses would not be missed. Then, seeing no change in the man's fearsome countenance, he finished weakly with the explanation that he had promised some roses to his daughter. The beastly man in the linen shirt waited in stony silence, as if considering his next words carefully. Then he drew himself up to his full height and said, You took advantage of my hospitality without asking. You ate my dinner. You slept in my chair. All of this I was willing to overlook without confronting you. However, you have now taken every bloom from my most prized rose bush. It has great personal meaning to me. There is not another like it, and each of those flowers is priceless in my estimation. I demand that you make an effort to compensate me for this. Hearing these words, Laurent felt his heart sink. He shook his head in defeat and told the man that he could not pay anything at all. He had nothing to offer. His stony-faced host regarded him coolly. In that case, you must work off your debt, he responded. I am in need of laborers here at my estate. Laurent gawked at him, trying to formulate another suggestion. But sir, he protested, I have six children at home. I cannot stay here with you. What will become of them? The man appeared unmoved. Either you work off your debt, or someone in your family must take your place, he said. Take your roses. They are no good to me now. Return to your family and make your arrangements. I will expect you or your replacement to be here within a week. If you do not appear, I will find you. 
With that, the glowering, fierce-looking man turned on his heel and strode toward the house. He never looked back, and Laurent watched him as he disappeared into the chateau. Laurent could see no other option than to go home and tell his children what he had done. He did not know how, but he would have to make arrangements for them to manage in his absence. Perhaps when the man had cooled his temper, he would see sense and not keep Laurent in his service too long. With the storm past and daylight on his side, Laurent was able to follow his path back to the main road and continue onward towards home. He rode steadily, but slowly, as he considered the news he'd have to share upon his arrival. It was a beautiful day. The mist lifted, and the early autumn sun showered him with a cheer that felt out of place. The birds sang sweetly, as if nothing was amiss. But his heart was heavy, and he was hesitant about what was to come. When he arrived home, Late that night, his children greeted him with excitement. After all, they were expecting gifts. Opening and closing his saddlebags, they playfully reached around to find the finery he had promised them. With regret, he instead offered each of them a rose. Camille took hers and smelled it with delight, admiring its perfection. But his other five children demanded to see their real presence. That night, around the crowded kitchen table, Laurent told his children what had happened on his ill-fated journey. To the port city. He related the loss of his remaining fortune, as well as the circumstances leading up to his current obligation to the owner of the mysterious chateau. When he concluded that he would have to return and work off his debt, the five oldest siblings were not pleased. They pouted, asking how they were supposed to manage in his absence. Camille alone was silent. She sat at the table with an unreadable expression, lost in thought. Finally, she called for silence. Her siblings looked at her with surprise, as Camille was usually not one to insert her opinion. Camille announced that she would return to the chateau to take her father's place. Laurent's eyes filled with tears. He protested that he could not and would not allow such a thing. However, Camille's sound reasoning was difficult to counter. Father was needed at home to support the family. She, however, could be spared. Furthermore, she did have some household skills and would be able to do whatever cleaning or cooking 
was allotted to her. No, she concluded, there was not another reasonable solution. It was she who would work off the family debt. It only took a day or two for Camille to prepare her modest belongings for the journey. As the rose her father brought her began to wilt, she pressed it in a book to dry. She wanted to have a reminder of why she was leaving home to work for this beastly stranger on a distant and isolated estate. Camille was nervous about leaving behind everything she had known, but she was determined to make her father proud. The morning of Camille's departure dawned bright and clear. She and Laurent packed her things into a small cart that they hitched their faithful mare. The chateau would be two days' walk, with the horse pulling the cart. Laurent knew of an inn where they could spend the night along the way. Her older siblings gathered in front of the cottage to see them off. Among them, there was a mixture of relief and unspoken admiration. They were glad that they would not be left to fend for themselves for very long. It was a somber journey for Laurent and Camille. The fine weather lasted all the first day and their night at the inn was uneventful. However, the second day of their trip proved to be blustery and sullen as autumn first began to stake its claim on the forest. The first of the fallen brown leaves blew across their path and the wind whistled through the trees. Their faithful horse clocked along the road, slowly drawing them nearer and nearer to their parting. When Laurent spotted the turn-off from the main road that would lead to the chateau, his heart began to break more with each step. Sensing her father's sinking spirits, Camille bolstered her courage and smiled at him reassuringly. Don't worry, father, she said soothingly. I am a capable person. I will be fine. He nodded, hoping it would be true. Inevitably, the pair arrived at the gloomy entrance to the estate. Laurent knew the time had come. Pushing the gate open once again, he led the horse through the opening and approached the forbidding mansion for the second time. Camille stared openly at what lay before her. Both the elaborate, overgrown gardens and the soaring, unforgiving walls of the house were grander than anything she'd ever seen before. It was overwhelming, but also beautiful in its austerity. As a girl who had grown up in a village, 
Camille was speechless over the sheer size of the place, and she deeply sensed its mystery and its permanence. The very stones seemed to slumber as if they had long waited in secret, hoping to be rediscovered. She wondered what kind of work she would be required to undertake here, and hoped that it was not beyond her capabilities as the former keeper of a humble cottage. Laurence stopped the horse and cart when they'd reached the wide front steps. The wind gusted at them sideways, as if to blow them away from the entrance of the building. He slowly ascended, lifted the heavy door knocker, and let it fall. Father and daughter stood at the steps and waited expecting the ferocious man of the house to appear. To their surprise, the door was slowly opened by a boy. He appeared to be about thirteen years old, and was dressed simply in the clothes of a villager. Sticking his head out of the opening, he observed the pair with frank curiosity. Then, appearing satisfied by his findings, he nodded. Is one of you the new servant then? he asked. Laurent was briefly taken aback, but he indicated that he had come to deliver his daughter, Camille who would be working off the debt in his place. The boy nodded, as if this was not at all surprising, and tugged hard on the door, motioning for her to come inside. Then he told Laurent he could leave Camille's things in the grand foyer and go. With that, the boy scuttled off into the recesses of the house, presumably to announce that the new servant waited. With the wind at her back, Camille walked through the doorway and into her new life. It was an emotional parting for Laurent and Camille but they both put on a brave face. He and the faithful horse turned homeward, the sullen skies weighing down on them, and did not look back until they were outside the gates of the chateau. Then the swaying trees of the forest closed in behind them. Camille stood uncertainly in the echoing hallway. The grey light of the overcast day made its way into the room via tall windows above the door, but it did nothing to create a feeling of warmth. She suppressed a shiver, edging closer to the trunk that held her belongings. She told herself she would need to muster her courage and do her best. After a few minutes, the boy came running back into the hall and announced to her that the Baron had told him to take her to her room. With that, he cheerfully picked up her trunk and began lugging it up the large, curving staircase. Camille followed him, surprised that she was going up instead of down to a kitchen or lower room. Perhaps, she thought, 
she would be lodging in the attic. To her surprise, the boy turned down the first grand hallway. They padded along the richly carpeted east wing of the chateau, their silent steps moving past staring portraits of nobles from bygone eras. It was as if they were the permanent residents, and this strange girl was an unexpected interloper. Camille was so busy looking at them that she almost collided with the boy when he finally stopped in front of a door and pushed it open. Camille followed him inside and was surprised to find herself standing in the most well-appointed bedroom she'd ever seen. It was not overly large, and the furnishings were sober, but the canopied bed, the fine fabrics, and the rich wood trim were very luxurious. While she surveyed the room, noting a cosy window seat and a small dressing table. The boy knelt and started a fire in the grate. When it was crackling, he stood and dusted off his hands, grinning at her. I'm Gabriel, he said, and I help the Baron out around here with this and that. I'm so glad you've come. It does get a bit solitary sometimes, and I could use some help with the day-to-day. Camille wasn't sure how to respond, although she wondered what exactly the day-to-day was. Instead, she thanked him for the fire, and asked when she would be meeting her new employer. Gabriel informed her that the Baron had indicated he would see her tomorrow, and that he'd explain her duties then. For now, the boy would be bringing her a simple supper, and hoped she would rest well for the night. Then, as suddenly as he had appeared, Gabriel left the room and closed the door silently behind him. Camille gathered her senses and went about unpacking her things. She hung her clothes in the large wardrobe and carefully put her small number of books on a side table by the bed. Flipping open the volume on top, she looked at the pink rose that lay between its pages. Smiling woefully to herself, she closed it again and pushed it to the side. Walking over to the window, she pulled the heavy drapes aside and tucked herself into the soft pillows of the window seat. From here, she had a sweeping view of the courtyard, with its gardens growing wildly around the edges of the walkways and up the stone walls around the chateau. Twilight was near, and the wind blew debris across the paved yard, tossing it up here and there into small cyclones. Dark clouds scudded across the rising moon. Exhausted by the journey and by the newness of this life, she briefly dozed there, cocooned inside the curtains. She was awakened by a knock on her door. 
pushing her way out of the window seat. She slowed her breathing purposefully and opened it. A tray lay outside with a simple dinner on it. Bread, cheese, some soup, and some hot tea. Looking up and down the hall, she saw nobody. Gabriel was light on his feet, that was certain. Taking the tray into her room, she set it on a small table by the fire. She found she was ravenous and ate every last bite. Then, barely bothering to get ready for bed, she pulled the coverlet back and crawled into the warm embrace of her sheets and pillow. It was less than a minute before she was asleep. That night, Camille had strange dreams. She saw herself walking the dark halls of the chateau, following a large dog. The animal disappeared into different rooms, reappearing a few seconds later in the hallway each time. Trying to catch up with it, she came to a doorway where it had recently vanished. She looked into the room, and instead of a dog, she saw the back of a man sitting at a desk. The man began to turn in his chair, but before he faced her, she awoke. Sitting upright in bed, she saw that the fire had died down, and the sun was shining in her window. As her waking confusion cleared, there was a knock at her door. Gabriel was standing outside with a tray. Good morning, Miss Camille, he said politely. I've brought you a bite of breakfast. Then, motioning in the general direction of the entryway, he added, The Baron requests that you meet him in his study when you are finished. Camille nodded to the boy, took the tray, and he disappeared again. An hour later, Camille stood nervously at the door of the very room where her father had once eaten his stolen fireside dinner. Camille could hear paper shuffling around inside. She cleared her throat and knocked lightly on the door. The noises stopped and she heard a chair scraping across the floor. Momentarily, an enormous man with a copious amount of facial hair appeared. His features were unattractively prominent and his face appeared to wear a natural scowl. He was a truly alarming sight, but Camille took care not to reveal her feelings and dipped her head politely in greeting. The huge man peered at her appraisingly and nodded his ungainly head in return. Then he gestured for her to be seated in a chair by the fire. He lowered himself into the armchair opposite. I see that you are the one to work off your father's debt. 
Are you familiar with basic household tasks, such as cleaning and some cooking? He asked. Camille nodded, indicating that she was. The man appeared pleased by this. He lifted a heavy ring of keys off a nearby table. As you can see, I am very short on help here. Gabriel takes care of my basic needs. His mother keeps me provisioned with bread, milk and eggs each day, and he runs errands to town. But there is nobody else to manage the estate other than myself. I'm sure you can tell that by looking around. It's still too much work for just you and Gabriel, but we will make do. He paused, as if waiting for a reply. Camille was aghast at the idea of being the only housekeeper in this huge mansion, but she didn't think there was a point in saying so. The man continued. These keys will open most rooms in the house, although there is little reason to use many of them. If you need something that Gabriel cannot get for you, please speak to me. Otherwise, I am not particular and would like you to make as many household decisions for yourself as possible. I spend most of my time in my study or in the library. Overwhelmed by the enormity of the job he was giving her, Camille could only nod, indicating that the interview was at an end. He stood abruptly. Camille rose from her seat took the ancient-looking keys from him and nodded. Then, as she made her way out of the room, he called after her. Dinner is at 7pm. I think it would be very sensible if you would join me in the dining room. Camille bobbed her head, thanked him and left the study. She stood, somewhat bewildered, in the echoing front hall, feeling at once that she was lost in it, and also that it was closing in on her. Spreading the heavy keys across her open palm, she gazed at them reflectively. She didn't know what doors they opened but they held a quiet aura of authority about them. She was stirred from her reverie by the sight of Gabriel emerging from the shadows. Grinning brightly in her direction, he asked if she would like a tour. She gratefully accepted and so her adventure of being the housekeeper at the chateau began. What Camille learned was that the employer lived alone and had for many years. Because of his fierce appearance, the people in the surrounding area feared him. They whispered unkind stories and spurned him rudely when he showed his face in public. Gabriel was the only person who connected him to the outside world. He had started by running errands for the Baron years ago, but he had soon come to love and appreciate 
the man behind the unapproachable visage. He insisted that the Baron's bark was worse than his bite. Now, Gabriel spent every day at the house, taking care of what necessities he could. At night, he returned to his family's small home on the outskirts of town. Truly, miss, he insisted, the Baron is a fair and kind-hearted man. Gabriel gave Camille a tour of the many rooms and the corridors of the entire chateau, which was suffering from neglect throughout. Most of the rooms along the gloomy hallways were unused. Camille's keys opened bedroom after bedroom that were covered in dust sheets, the fireplaces cold. Some rooms had not been used for decades or even centuries. Furniture and belongings were piled high in those places, laced with cobwebs. The windows filtered the light weakly from outside, as the glass was coated in many years of grime. As Camille discovered, there were just a few rooms that were used every day, and these she must try to clean and organize. Those included the kitchen, the Baron's study, and the front entryway. Most marvelous, however, was the library. Gabriel allowed Camille to peek into the library while the Baron was busy elsewhere and she was astounded by it. A huge room with high ceilings and gold trim opened before her. Bookcases stretched all the way to the very top, lining every part of every wall, except where there was a window. Rolling ladders perched at the end of each side of the room, ready to slide across the bookcase and allow the visitor to reach any volume they wanted. And the volumes. It seemed there were too many to count. With spines in many colors of crimson, forest green, navy blue, and brown, each begged to be pulled from the shelf and perused at length. Camille was an avid reader of the few books she had possessed during her father's financial disgrace, but she had never seen or imagined a collection like this one. According to Gabriel, the Baron spent a large amount of his time here, and it did appear to be true. Tables throughout this lavish hideaway were piled with tomes that were open to particular pages or collected in groups. Two worn leather armchairs spoke of long hours turning their heavy pages. Gabriel told her solemnly that he was to always keep the fire going in the grate during the day. Camille imagined what it would be like to open one of these countless volumes and sink into a soft chair, inhaling the scent of the aged and ink-laden paper. 
It was intoxicating. Camille knew that the only way to make progress in this neglected house was simply to choose a place and begin. That first day, she and Gabriel dusted and aired the front hall and cleaned the kitchen. Gabriel and the Baron had been making simple meals there for a long time, but much of the space was in need of attention. Camille was not an expert cook, but she took pleasure in making the kitchen shine again. She sent Gabriel to town with a list of supplies to be delivered. Then, standing in the grand, silent kitchen, she began to work. Unused countertops were cleared of their dust. Pots and pans received a much needed polish. The cold and empty space slowly began to feel alive again. By the time she was due to sit down to dinner with the Baron, she had prepared a simple meal of roasted chicken. It was not complicated, but she was proud of it. With little time to tidy herself, Camille returned to her room. Gabriel had rekindled the fire there, and she used her pitcher and washstand to freshen up, putting on her nicest dress. As she walked to the window to pull the drapes for the night, she paused and peered out into the gloom. The courtyard lay silent, as if in wait. Nothing stirred, not even a bird was visible. It was as if the grounds were under a spell of silence. She thoughtfully tugged the velvet curtains together and pulled herself away from the sight. There was much to learn about this place, she thought. Then, lighting a candle, she made her way down the velvety twilight of the darkening hallway and slowly descended the wide stairs to the tall doors of the dining room. The space was very grand for two people. At one time, it had surely hosted glittering parties and showy formal dinners. Looking up, she admired the sparkling crystal chandelier which loomed over the chamber like a canopy of stars. Gabriel had set two places at one end of the long table, and the dinner had been laid out. She was the first to arrive. She did not have long to wait. The Baron's hulking shape appeared awkwardly in the doorway. He paused and nodded his head briefly in greeting. Then he motioned to the two place settings to indicate she should have a seat. Camille gladly took one of the upholstered chairs. I can see you have been hard at work with Gabriel today, the Baron commented, raising his eyebrows at the hearty dinner she had prepared. 
He has borne a heavy burden these past years, as my only help. I'm glad you will be here to take on some of his labors. Camille nodded, unsure of how to respond. Then she said, My lord, and paused when he shook his head. Please, you may simply call me Antoine, he responded. I am lord of nothing now, lord of this chateau and its pile of dusty relics, he jested darkly. Then, looking in her eye, he said, I am sorry you were compelled to come here under such conditions, but I hope you will be comfortable. I try to be a fair man and I am glad of the company. Camille nodded and smiled briefly. Would you like me to tidy the library tomorrow? She asked. I was not sure if you wanted me to go in there. The Baron thought briefly and nodded, saying that it would be fine. Then he offered you should feel free to borrow any book that you liked from the room. After all, in the words of Descartes, the reading of all good books is like a conversation with the finest minds of past centuries. I think you will find that my library has quite an incredible capacity to provide any book you have ever heard of. It is rather magical in that regard. Surprised by his kind offer and civilized words, Camille observed her unfortunate looking employer while he ate. She had been at the chateau only a day and her entire view of her situation had begun to change. She was the mistress of a large house, with full independence to work as she chose, and she had just been offered entrance to a vast library. Perhaps this twist of fate was not going to be as grim as she had imagined. She regarded her plate quietly in the flickering firelight, hearing only the clinking of silverware on china. The Baron and Camille did not speak much during that dinner, finishing their food in respectful silence. Later, when she rested comfortably, tucked into the crisp white sheets in her grand canopied bed, Camille felt hopeful. This isolated estate appeared to hold many intriguing secrets, and she looked forward to discovering them in good time. Turning over on her side, she gazed sleepily at the drapes again, closed tightly against the night outside the window. Inside this chateau, there was a flame that was keeping this place warm. She could feel it. The next day, after tidying up the kitchen, Camille cautiously approached the library. She knew the Baron was in his other study, and it seemed like a good time to explore the marvelous room of books under the guise of cleaning it. Taking a duster, 
she began methodically moving around the stack of books and between tables, addressing neglected surfaces that had collected a layer of dirt over time. As she was about to move some stacked volumes aside, Antoine appeared in the doorway. Please don't disturb any stacks or open books, he said. Camille apologized, backing away from the pile she had been touching. No need to apologize, he reassured her. I realize it looks untidy. It's just that I am researching and I don't want to lose my place. Then, he asked her if she had chosen a volume for herself. She responded that she had not, and asked if he had any recommendations. Camille admitted that she felt unequal to the task of understanding such important works. She had come from a much less learned background than he. Antoine smiled and spread his hands wide, saying, Awareness of ignorance is the beginning of wisdom. Seeing her confusion, he winked humorously at her and added, That bit of wisdom is from Socrates. Striding across the room, he picked up a small volume on a lower shelf and handed it carefully to her. Maybe you would like some of his other thoughts. He believed strongly that we should all ask a lot of questions. Camille took the book with a nod of thanks and prepared to leave the room. Before she did, however, she turned and indicated that she did, in fact, have a question. Would it be possible for me to engage some villagers to come and tidy the gardens before winter? She asked. Antoine looked at her somewhat mournfully and shrugged. If Gabriel can find anyone willing to venture onto the estate, you are welcome to do that. Unfortunately, most are afraid to enter the walls of the chateau. I'm afraid many outlandish tales have been told about me over the years, which is why I find myself mostly alone. Camille frowned. How can you bear it? Does it not make you angry to be treated so unfairly? The Baron looked down thoughtfully and responded. I was once a better looking man who was also vain and foolish. It took a great misfortune for me to see the error of my ways, and the scorn people have for me is probably just payment for my folly. Camille did not respond. She wouldn't ask any more questions today, but she was determined to find out more about how her employer had fallen into such an unfortunate state. For now, she was looking forward to reading Socrates in her room after dinner. Camille quickly adjusted to her new life as the housekeeper of the chateau, and even came to love it. By sheer bribery, she was able to have Gabriel hire a few village men 
who came to the estate one day and rid the gardens of years of neglect. This was only after they received strict instructions from Camille not to hurt the rose bush by the pergola. Apparently, it had been planted by Antoine's mother and was very special to him. She almost regretted having the village men come to the house when she overheard them speaking ill of Antoine. They say he is an absolute monster, one exclaimed loudly to the other. Lives like an animal in there, another added. No manners and unfit for human company. But I'll take his money, the man finished rudely. Camille noticed Antoine standing by the window listening to the entire exchange. She rushed to close it, anxious to spare him the men's heartlessness. He waved her off, apparently unconcerned. I'm used to this type of talk, he explained. It has been many years since I was able to circulate in society. Camille was nonetheless upset. How can you tolerate such unfairness from people who don't even know you? How do you not loathe them? she asked. He shrugged, gazing thoughtfully at a stack of books on a nearby table. A great English playwright named William Shakespeare once wrote, Heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself. By bearing good will for these unknowing people, I ease the burden on myself. Then he smiled and nodded at Camille, saying, you might like to read Shakespeare yourself. He wrote some excellent plays. And with that, he turned back to his stack of books, leaving Camille to consider his words and the dreary day outside. Despite the large amount of work that waited to be done each day, Camille still made time to explore the house. As autumn properly set in, with its crisp days, early sunsets and chilly evenings, she would wander the corridors with a candle, using her heavy ring of house keys to find out what was behind the myriad closed doors that lined the halls. Most of them were bedrooms. It was obvious that this country chateau had once hosted many fine guests of the nobility. Now covered in dust sheets, one darkened room after another revealed elegant four-poster beds, expensive furniture, and dusty, fabric-covered chairs. One day, she found what appeared to be a very special room. It had clearly been a lady's chamber. Unlike the other ones, however, it was still full of her belongings. A graceful dressing table was covered with jars of powder and perfume bottles that twinkled in the afternoon sunlight. Elaborate wigs 
of the type worn decades ago sat nearby on their own stands, as if waiting to be taken to a ball. Opening the wardrobe, Camille was astounded to find a row of decadent silk dresses in the fashion of the time before the revolution. She ran her hand lightly over their delicate skirts, almost afraid that they would disintegrate in her fingers. She imagined the elegant woman who must have worn them. Opening the chest of drawers, she saw that it was filled with glittering necklaces. One small velvet container held a ring with a twinkling sapphire in it. Closing the box, Camille slid the drawer shut quietly. She would not want to appear to be thieving. Regretfully, she slipped back out of the room and locked it again. It was like a portal to a happier time, and by far the most beautiful thing she'd seen in the house. Camille faithfully wrote letters to her father, which Gabriel took to town when he ran errands. In them, she reassured him that she was being treated very well, and that she enjoyed her work. Soon, she was even able to begin sending him some money. After her first month, the Baron had told her that he couldn't let her keep working without pay, as the damage to the rosebush had certainly been made up for. He said that he hoped she would stay, and that he would be giving her a weekly salary for the work. Camille gladly accepted. As Antoine's housekeeper, she felt she had found her calling. All her powers of organization were put to good use, and the excellent company and the access to his incredible library were becoming her chief joys in life. In fact, it was easy to forget that Antoine was considered unsightly. Nothing had changed about him, except that Camille made sure his clothes were better kept and more presentable. Once in a while, however, she would see a normal, nice-looking man reflected back in a mirror when he passed it on the wall. Or she would be speaking with him, and he would no longer be covered in hair, and his features would seem more harmonious. In such cases, she would blink a few times and refocus, and see that he was the same fearsome-looking man as before. Perhaps the dark magic of the chateau was working on her mind, she thought, with wry amusement. Occasionally, a beggar would come to the door, with the biting winter wind at his back not knowing anything about the notoriety of the estate. In her village at home, beggars had been generally rebuffed and rarely received any help. The attitude of the townspeople had been that they deserved what they got and that hard-working people didn't end up destitute as they were. Camille expected Antoine to send them packing, 
but instead he would ask her to give them a meal and some coins before they left. Camille was moved to ask him why he exhibited such charity. After all, nobody who lived nearby showed any kindness to him. Once again, he referred to a great philosopher he admired, this one named Aristotle, saying, It is the characteristic of the magnanimous man to ask no favour, but to be ready to do kindness to others. Then, somewhat woefully, he added, I must learn to be a more magnanimous man, because it is my prior path in life that led me to ruin. She was not able to get any other explanation out of him at that moment, but she yearned to better understand exactly what had happened to Antoine. That evening, they chatted companionably in the candlelit dining room over a hearty winter stew. It was then that Camille worked up the courage to ask him how he had come to be so alone at the chateau. Antoine appeared to hesitate, sighing deeply and leaning back in his chair at the table. Then, taking a long sip of his drink, he began to tell a story. Many years ago, I lived here with my mother. My father had died when I was a young man, and that was how I became lord here. I loved my mother. She was a beautiful person, inside and out. Always the life of the party, but still managing to be kind to everyone. It was her rosebush that your father stripped of its blooms. Antoine paused uncomfortably, and then continued. When my mother became ill and passed away, I was left here to my own devices, and I'm ashamed to say that I did not live well. I was inexperienced and foolish. I squandered the family money on extravagant possessions and ridiculous parties. I neglected the estate left bills unpaid, and didn't care for my employees as I should have. Without my mother's good influence, I fell into a poor lifestyle, and was of no worth to anyone, including myself. One night, my servant told me there was a woman at the door begging for food and coin. I was in the midst of a lavish party and could not be bothered. I told him to suggest to her that she go somewhere and get employment. At this memory, Antoine grimaced, obviously pained by his own words. Before the servant could send the woman off, she pushed herself through the crack in the door and told me that I was cursed by my own foolish vanity. She declared that I would spend my days spurned and unloved, and that the secret to my release could only be found in humanity. At this, Camille furrowed her brow. 
humanity. What did she mean by that? Antoine shrugged. This is the riddle I have wrestled with for decades. I appear to have a limitless number of books in my library by wise philosophers, mathematicians, and poets. The best and wisest of what humanity has to offer is at my fingertips, probably part of my strange enchantment. My mind does improve, but all the brilliance of humanity has yet to provide me a release from my curse. Camille regarded him from across the table. She could hear the light crackling of the fire punctuating the silence, and imagined him sitting before many fires for a long time without anyone to talk to. She wondered how many years he'd been trapped here in this solitary prison, turning the pages of countless books in his library, searching for redemption. Antoine smiled brightly in an attempt to break the awkward silence. Ah oh well, he added, as the excellent Isaac Newton said, to arrive at the simplest truth requires years of contemplation. One of these days I may yet find the answer. Lying curled up on her bed that night, Camille felt she had finally put the pieces together. For all these years, Antoine had spent his time studying, thinking, absorbing, and repenting. He was no longer a man who would refuse kindness to even the undeserving. She did wonder what else there was that he could do. Would he forever be trapped here with his books and the dusty souvenirs of the regrettable person he used to be. She hoped not, because she had really come to admire him. She pulled the covers tighter around her chin, and gazed drowsily at the remnants of the fire glowing in the hearth. Surrounded by the silence of the house, she slept for another night. All through the crystalline deep freeze of winter, Camille and Antoine went about their lives at the chateau in pleasant companionship, with Gabriel as their faithful connection to the outside world. Many of the rooms in the enormous mansion simply stayed locked and unused. The part of the house the trio needed for their daily activities was snug and clean, thanks to Camille's faithful management. Meals were simple, but hearty. The blinding white snow piled high in the courtyard, and sometimes the bleak wind whistled in the abandoned passages. But the inhabitants of the chateau stayed close to the fireplaces, buried in their books. At last, the first signs of spring arrived. With it, Camille received a letter from her father. He said her oldest sister had managed to make a marriage match, and that her wedding would take place in a couple of weeks. 
he asked if the Baron would consider allowing her to take some leave in order to attend the festivities at home. If so, Laurent would be pleased to come and fetch her from the estate. When Camille presented this request to Antoine, he put down his book and gazed at her with a sad smile. He said, of course she must go, and she should take all the time she needed. As she thanked him for giving his permission, she once again did not see a beast looking back at her. She only saw a man. She had to blink several times to dispel the illusion. As she left the room, she paused briefly and gazed at him again over her shoulder. Then she left him to his reading, putting the moment behind her. Her journey to and from her sister's wedding was uneventful. The family greeted her with much curiosity and perhaps some newfound respect. They admired the tasteful new clothes she had acquired using her salary. It was obvious that the money she was sending to them had helped secure her sister's marriage, humble though the match might be. Her family was no longer seen by the villagers as being impoverished. Rather, they were viewed as being stable and acceptable, thanks to her regular income. And yet, Camille felt less at home in the family cottage than she once had. Although she had been contained inside the walls of the chateau this entire time, she felt like her world view had changed and her horizons had vastly expanded. Seated around the fire with her siblings, who focused only on their own petty concerns, she felt stifled She regretted having to leave her father again, but Camille also felt relief when he parted from her at the gates of Antoine's estate. She was ready to return to her life as mistress of the house. Her happiness, however, turned to dismay when she saw the disarray that awaited her. Gabriel answered the door eagerly, obviously delighted that she'd returned. He whispered to her that nothing had been the same since she'd left, and that the Baron was disheveled and did not leave his library. After putting away her things, Camille went straight to see Antoine. As she cautiously opened the door to the library, she found the room in a complete mess. Books were everywhere, lying open, in stacks, and generally tossed about the floor. Empty drinking glasses lined the tables. Antoine sat slumped in a chair, looking as if he hadn't changed his shirt in days. At the sound of her arrival, however, he looked up with an expression of sheepish relief. Once again, in this moment, 
Camille felt she only saw him as a regular man, and she struggled to adjust her view. She knew, logically, that she was standing before an unkempt, unshaven, and rather beastly person. However, her eyes were playing tricks. It took a moment before she saw him properly again. Yes, there he was, in dire need of cheering up. It only took a few days for Camille to set everything right again. The dust and neglect of a couple of weeks were easily dealt with, and the Baron's mood improved instantly upon her return. Gabriel begged her, in confidence, however, not to go away again. He said the Baron had sunk immediately into the most terrible melancholy, and had been completely useless about managing anything at all, including remembering to eat his meals. With spring bursting out all over the estate, it was impossible to be sad for long. Camille became very glad she had taken the trouble to have the garden cleared before the winter. The courtyard was absolutely beautiful, and the lovely plantings designed many years ago by Antoine's mother were once again shown to their best effect. Flowers in a rainbow of colours delicately presented themselves. The birds seemed to increase their number by the day singing sweetly in the morning, inviting the residents of the chateau to the garden. Camille and Antoine took to spending afternoons reading outside in the pergola, and he often released Gabriel from his tasks early, so that he could enjoy the afternoon with friends. Camille also took great pleasure in opening the windows of the stuffy mansion and airing it out. Throughout the estate, life began to feel fresh and new, as if the entire place had turned a corner. As the summer grew near, Camille received another message from her father. It seemed now that her other sister was due to wed. Once again, she was invited to attend the event. Camille was torn. She felt obligated to be with her family for the nuptials but she couldn't imagine leaving Antoine once again. Faced with this dilemma, she came up with a highly unusual plan. She suggested to Antoine that he should escort her to the wedding and take a room at an inn nearby. Antoine was aghast at the suggestion. Have you not seen how people react to me? He asked her. Camille had been expecting this, and she countered that her own village was far from here, and that people would not already have opinions about him based on hearsay. Privately, Camille did not view him as being terrible anymore. She only saw the wise, kind man 
that she'd come to know. Surely, she thought, the people at home would give him a fair chance. The strangeness of a lord attending a village wedding did not even matter to Camille. She had long ago stopped seeing Antoine as either beast or baron. He resisted and refused, but Camille said she would not go without him. Faced with the prospect of causing her to miss her sister's wedding, Antoine finally agreed. He seemed to dread the prospect, however, and was in a dark mood as the planning went forward. Camille would not be deterred. She sent Gabriel to the tailor in town, requesting that a new and well-cut suit of clothes be made to Antoine's measurements. It had not escaped her notice all this time that he was wearing the frivolous styles from decades before. The new fashion these days was cleaner and simpler. He would have a dignified suit that made him look less like a relic. Rooms at the inn were engaged and the carriage was dusted off. Finally, a day came that Gabriel wished the pair well on their journey. He had never seen the Baron leave the estate. He promised to keep everything from falling apart before their return. The journey to Camille's village was speedy by carriage. The distance was covered in just a day, and what a fine one it was. Summer was showing its face with verdant exuberance. As the horse clipped and clopped down the road through the forest, the birds sang joyously from the canopy of foliage over their heads. Bright rays of sunshine lit the road ahead of them, and the new leaves whispered beguilingly in the breeze. At first, Antoine was silent, as if passively resisting the reality that he was accompanying Camille somewhere in public. After a few miles, however, the pair slipped into conversation about a book Camille had been reading, and soon they were having their usual lively exchange. Camille smiled to herself to see the best in him come out. Looking at him from the side, she could have sworn she was sitting next to a charming fellow. Happy with that idea, she did not try to dispel the magic. Inevitably, their companionable journey had come to an end. As twilight fell, and the crickets began to serenade the fields with their nightly song. Antoine and Camille pulled up at her family's cottage and halted the carriage. By the time they had climbed down from their seats, the entire family was at the front door. All four of her remaining unmarried siblings gawking rudely at them both. Laurent made a much greater effort to contain himself. He stepped forward 
and nodded politely to Antoine, thanking him for bringing Camille and for honoring them with his visit. However, Camille felt her cheeks grow hot with shame when her brother loudly whispered something to her older sister, causing the silly girl to laugh. It was obvious to everyone that they were making jokes about the Baron. It was a relief to everyone when Antoine departed for his lodgings. Camille allowed herself to be ushered inside, where she spent the evening talking with Laurent and her siblings, asking politely about the wedding preparations. She was worried, however, about how Antoine was faring at the inn and hoped he was not suffering ill behavior there. When her head lay on her pillow that night, she drifted off to sleep with thoughts of him weighing heavily on her. She realized she would be glad when they'd gotten through this wedding and returned to the chateau which she now felt was her real home. Antoine looked grim when he arrived at the church the next day for the wedding. It was obvious that Camille's fears had come true. They sat in silence during the ceremony, both feeling as if they were being stared at the entire time. The small church felt tiny, with the whole congregation scrutinizing them. The celebration afterwards was on the village green. The party was simple but festive, with punch, cakes, and wildflowers creating a happy atmosphere. Ladies gathered in groups, delicately eating sweets, while children tumbled across the lawn, enjoying an afternoon of play. Camille and Antoine, however, did not feel part of the celebration. She stayed at his side, stiffly nodding to the villagers who had once been so kind to her. The welcoming people who had taught her to garden and bake years ago were now standing at a distance, whispering behind their hands and nodding knowingly in her direction. Not one neighbor had a polite word for Antoine, who smiled at all and said nothing. Her family was no help. They ignored the pair completely. As Camille and Antoine stood, fervently wishing for the party to end, they overheard two men speaking nearby. He may have money, one said with a smirk, but he'll never convince anyone to marry him with a face like that. The other man laughed. It's a sad state of affairs when you have to court your own maid, he responded. Those words were the last straw. Camille put down her punch and walked to the center of the gathering, tersely announcing that she had something to say and that everyone must listen. I convinced the Baron to come with me, 
because I thought you to be good people, she said. I was sure that his fine character and his kindness would make it obvious to you all that he is not the beast people make him out to be. Well, I'm ashamed to say that I was wrong. None of you are worthy of his notice. We will trouble you no longer. Let me tell you this. Antoine is a better man than any other here. I would choose him as a companion over every single one of you a hundred times over. And that's the truth. The company was completely silent, looking in bewilderment from Camille to Antoine and back again. As she turned to face him, she saw the strangest thing. Where he had stood, a handsome, dignified man stood smiling gratefully in her direction. No matter how many times she tried to adjust her view or clear her head, his visage did not change. The excess of facial hair, the overly prominent features, and the massive proportions would not return. He was as handsome as any man she'd known. And that did not change. And whether it was a shift in perspective or the workings of an enchantment, the other people at the party seemed to be going about their celebrations as if nothing had happened. They greeted Antoine warmly and smiled at Camille as if nothing in the world was amiss. It was as if the entire embarrassing episode had never occurred. The villagers behaved for all the world like they'd never seen a beast in their company. It was both baffling and miraculous. A veil had been lifted for good. This quiet moment of triumph was how Antoine finally was released from his enchantment. All these years, he had been seeking answers in his library, researching the wisdom of humanity but he had misunderstood the woman who had cursed him. Those lonely decades of becoming kinder, more generous, and more forgiving had created in him the humanity that had won Camille's heart. That was the missing piece that had freed him from his curse. Not long after, Camille and Antoine sat together under the pergola in his garden, admiring his mother's rosebush, which was blooming abundantly once again. Twilight was descending upon the chateau and the crickets were emerging to serenade the world as the happy pair enjoyed the balmy summer evening. Camille considered this glad new Antoine, appreciating his handsome face, so long hidden behind the guise of the beast. As she watched, he sat up straighter and reached into his pocket, 
pulling out the very ring she had secretly admired in his mother's dresser. You were the only person who took the trouble to get to know me as I really was, he said to her. Then, in his way, he fell back to a quote from one of his many books. As Copernicus said, in the middle of everything is the sun. You have become that sun to me. Winking at her, he added, After all, I think you have adequately demonstrated that you are more than qualified to manage this chateau. Camille laughed and nodded her agreement, allowing him to slip the sparkling blue gem onto her finger. Gazing at it in wonder, she remembered the moment she had first seen it in the mysterious bedroom, among the fine dresses and the other jewels. It winked at her in the sunlight, as if to communicate a precious secret. She would now be part of the history of this house. Before the end of the summer, Antoine and Camille exchanged their vows in the courtyard of the chateau surrounded by the heavenly scent of the flowering rose bushes and the sweet song of the birds from the treetops. As they stood in the shadow of the house, Camille looked at Antoine with a grateful heart and felt a strong sense of belonging in a place she had once found so foreign. This was no longer the same desolate place where she had arrived just a year ago. Through kindness, patience, and the search for wisdom, she and Antoine had also found happiness.